Good morning, folks, as you are signing in and uh, connecting with us on Zoom. We, um, we just want to welcome you into this time together. Um, as MCC um, leads this conversation um, on issues of race and power, and, um, and this is the first time we actually have folks from all across our country. So let's take a quick moment here. And as people are zooming in, I think we're going to be having about 200 of us today on, um, on this webinar. Um, just maybe in your chat, right? Where are you zooming from? We want to know who's on. And if you just want to put where you're zooming in from, that would be awesome so that we can be reading and hearing from folks. So here's Salem and Lancaster and Goshen and Fresno. Um, yes, yes, look at this. This is wonderful. Yeah, look at this. This is really cool. Readly, I saw Readly in there, yes. That's a space I'm becoming more familiar with here. Philadelphia, Elkhart, Indiana, Oroville, Lititz. Vermont, nice, wonderful, wonderful, look at this. There are rare moments when MCC is able to come together in this way. Typically, our um, day of learning has been focused in Akron, Pennsylvania, and uh, this is actually our fourth annual day of learning. Um, the first year, uh, four years back, we focused on white supremacy, understanding white supremacy culture, and it was just um, in, in, un, in learning about how important it is that MCC commit to dismantling oppression. And we spent the full day learning what is white supremacy and where is it visible and where is it hidden, but it's real and it's present. Um, three years back, we uh, spent some time looking at uh, mass incarceration and the connections between mass incarceration and racism, who's in prison, who has been targeted? How do we use power and laws and those spaces to continue to have this new Jim Crow idea? And so we spent the day looking at that. Last year um, in Akron, again, the commitment to this was to learn about housing disparities and the history of who had access to housing, how people could gain wealth, where do people live, where is the limitation, what are some of the laws that were laid with uh, redlining. And so the focus last year was all around this piece. And this year, our focus is looking at um, Doctrine of Discovery. We have a special guest that has joined us already and will be presenting for us in the next hour and a half together. And we'll be looking at um, at the, uh, the theme for, for um, Mark's talk today is the cost of Doctrine of Discovery. And um, as we're preparing for this piece, I want to share with you a little bit about who, who our guest is. So um, Mark Charles has been a colleague, a friend. Um, he has uh, done some training with us in Washington, D.C. at our tier one training there the last three years. Um, what usually is about an hour and a half uh, session turns out to be two and a half because the information, the richness of what he has to share is so powerful. And so over the years, we have really been uh, blessed and, uh, and uh, fortunate to have him in D.C. Um, join us for a training and looking at um, these historical spaces of injustice uh, through a lens of someone who is um, not only from that community, uh, someone who understands it and can call us into a space of, of, um, of transformation and, um, and information. So, so let me introduce to you um, our guest speaker for today. His name is Mark Charles, and uh, he's a dynamic and thoughtful, provoking public speaker. He's a writer. He's a consultant. He's the son of an American woman of Dutch heritage and of a Navajo man. He teaches with insight into the complexities of America's history regarding race, culture, faith, in order to help forge a path of healing and conciliation for a nation. He is one of the leading authorities on the 15th century doctrine of discovery and its influence on the U.S. and its intersections with modern day society. Mark co-authored along with Sushan Ra the book entitled Unsettling Truth the ongoing 
dehumanizing legacy of doctrine of discovery. Mark also ran uh, as an independent candidate for the US presidency in 2020. And uh, we were just zooming a minute ago or so, and um, we were just thankful and identifying the fact that we yesterday was a day of transition of power. And many folks across our nation have been praying for a peaceful transition. And, um, and just, a, it feels, things feel a little bit lighter today because we didn't have a, a, a mass riot yesterday in DC. And this is where, where Mark lives. And so today, um, MCC welcomes Mark into the space. Again, my name is Dina Gonzalez Pina. I am the executive director for West Coast MCC. And uh, formerly I was working on issues of um, anti-racism. And so this is our commitment again to understanding and hearing with ears and hearts to the history of our nation. So Mark, thank you again for your commitment and, um, and your leadership in this work. Thank you everybody. And thank you, Dean. It's so good to be with you. Um, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to talk with you about the Doctrine of Discovery. And we are gonna have about an hour and a half today to go into depth onto these topics. And that may sound like a lot, <laughs> but for the amount of content we have to go through, uh, we actually are gonna have to push pretty fast to get through all of this. I could very easily fill a half day, if not a full um, two or three day conference with this material. And not only to cover it, but also to really be able to digest it and to have time to talk, to talk about it and ask questions. Uh, before we begin, let me just start by introducing myself. So, Yak E, Mark Charles Yinishia, in our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people, and our identities come from our mother's mother. My mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and that's why I say Loosely translated, it means I'm from the wooden shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother, is Toihiglini which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsinbeke Dene'e. And then my fourth clan, my father's father, is Tolichitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. I also want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from Washington, D.C. And these are the lands of the Piscataway. Um, the Piscataway are the nation that they've lived here, they've hunted here, they farmed here, they fished here. They were here long before Columbus got lost at sea, and they are still here. One of the things I was most deeply disappointed about yesterday during the inauguration is that there was not a land acknowledgement that this transfer of power was taking place on Piscataway lands. I was also disappointed with this song that they sang that talked about this land is your land, this land is our land, and it didn't acknowledge that that very land where they were standing was ethnically cleansed of native peoples so that Washington DC could be built up. And so I want to acknowledge today the Piscataway Nation. I want to honor them as the host people of these lands. I want to thank them for their stewardship of these lands. I want to acknowledge that they are still here and I want to express how humbled I am to have an opportunity to live on these lands and to speak to you today from these lands. I'm gonna share my screen here and we're gonna go through to talk about um, this doctrine of discovery. So let me begin, just give me a second here while I share my screen and we get this, this ready and then we'll be set to go. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Before we get into really talking in depth about the Doctrine of Discovery, there's a few other acknowledgements I want to make in this. <clears throat> the first is um, that I'm not the first, nor am I the last person to write or speak about this topic. There have been many um, authors and activists and people who have been working to bring the doctrine of discovery to the forefront for um, many, many years. I want to mention two of them today. The first, his name is Stephen Newcomb. Um, Stephen uh, has written a great book. It's called Pagans in the Promised Land. It's one of the, the first references that I was given regarding the doctrine of discovery, and it is a great resource. 
Uh, Steve and I don't agree on everything, but he is a, a very good voice in the discussion on the Doctrine of Discovery, and I highly recommend his book to you um, if you're able to get a hold of it. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a, a dense read. There's a lot of information in there, but I highly recommend it. Another person I want to honor, her name is Marcella Labue. Marcella Labue is a 100-year-old Army veteran. She served in World War II as a nurse. And I met her at the Frank Lemaire Native American Presidential Forum in August of 2019. And she was 99 years old at the time. And this was a, a forum of presidential candidates. Bernie Sanders was there. Kamala Harris was there. Uh, Elizabeth Warren was there. I was there. There was about 10 of the, the, the top uh, Democratic candidates and myself as an independent. And they were asking questions and responding to issues about Native America and questions from Indian country. And Marcella was one of the people there asking questions. And she was asking questions about um, something we'll talk about later, which is called the, the Remove the Stain Act, which addresses the uh, Medals of Honor given to uh, US soldiers who participated in the massacre at Wounded Knee. But also several times throughout the day, she asked candidates about the doctrine of discovery. I was so deeply impressed by her tenacity that I went up to, to speak with her afterwards. And I was deeply honored by the work she's done to kind of bring this to the forefront. And even as a 99 year old woman to question presidential candidates about their understanding of the doctrine of discovery and what are they gonna do to make sure that atrocities like these things do not happen again. So I wanna honor both Stephen Newcomb and his work as well as Marcelo Lebu and there are many, many others who have been working to bring this dialogue to the forefront. To understand the doctrine of discovery, and we'll get into to what it is more later. I mean, essentially it's a, it's a series of papal bulls that's essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are less than human and their land is yours to take. But the question is, and the question I want to deal with for the next half hour, is how did we get, how did the church get from the teachings of Jesus, who said things like, love your neighbor and pray for those who persecute you, how did it get from that to a doctrine of discovery that basically said you can kill people who don't look like, speak like, worship like, or act like you? Now, to understand how we get from one point to the next, we have to go back actually into the Old Testament of the Bible, all the way back to Abraham, to understand the Old Testament legacy of land covenants. Land covenants is an agreement made with the God of Abraham to Abraham and then extended to the people of Israel throughout their history. And basically, the land covenant said, if you obey me and keep my commands, I will bless you in the land I'm giving to you. And if you disobey me, I will exile you. I will even curse you and remove you from the land that I've given to you. So the land covenant that the God of Abraham had with the people of Israel, it set up a barometer of prosperity. The people of Israel knew if they were prosperous, they could have a fairly good understanding that they were doing well in their relationship with God. If their borders were strong, if their families were safe, if their land was secure, if their crops were growing, they could take some assurance that they were doing well in their relationship with God. If their crops weren't growing, if their borders were not fortified, if they were not safe and secure, if they were even removed from their lands, that was a pretty good um, bet that they had made a misstep in their relationship with God. So their prosperity was not their only barometer, but it was one of their barometers of how their relationship of God was going. We see this in Deuteronomy chapter 30, where it says that if you keep his commands and his ordinances, and this is where the, where the people of Israel are standing at the banks of the Jordan River, ready to cross over and take their promised lands. And it says that if if you keep his commands and his ordinance and his laws and the articles of our covenant, with him that we may live and be multiplied and that the Lord our God may bless us in the land whether we go in to possess it. But if our hearts shall turn away so that we will not obey and we worship other gods, we will surely perish out of the good land whether we cross over this river to possess it. This is a good summary of what the land covenant was and how it worked. 
Again, if they obeyed God, they would be blessed. If they disobeyed God, they would be cursed and exiled from their lands. Their prosperity was one of their barometers. Now, when Jesus came into history, when he came into Israel, born as a child, he was coming into an Israel that was not prosperous. They were under the oppression of the Roman people. They were not able to worship freely. They did not have open access to their own governance. They were being taxed. They were being census. They, they were under the oppression of the Roman people. And the people of Israel were waiting for a Messiah. They had not actually heard from God in hundreds of years. And they were waiting for God to send a Messiah. Someone who was going to come and throw off the oppression of the Roman, of the Roman Empire. And hopefully restore them back to the greatness that they experienced during the kingdom of David. This is what they were looking from their Messiah. This is what they were looking for. Now, Jesus knew that he was coming in as the Messiah, but he also knew that he had a plan that wasn't quite in line with what the people were expecting. And so he did some very intentional things, or God sent him in some very intentional ways to try and change those expectations. Yes, he was the Messiah, the Son of God, but he was born in a barn. Yes, he was, he was the, the son of the creator of the universe, but he was raised as a refugee in Egypt and then grew up in the backwater town of Nazareth. Yes, he was the son of God and angels announced his coming, but they were singing to shepherds and people outside the society out in the field. God was trying to change some expectations of what this Messiah was going to look like and what they could expect from him. Early in his ministry, Satan comes to Jesus and tempts him. He takes him to the top of a high space, and he shows him what he thought was the goal, which was the kingdoms of the world. He says, if that Jesus will just bow down and worship him, he will give him, again, what he thought the goal was, which was an earthly kingdom, earthly empire, reestablishment of this land covenant. Jesus saw that temptation and he rejected it. He said, no, I'm not going to bow down to worship you. That's not the goal. And he walks away from Satan. John the Baptist, who was the person who was heralding the coming of Jesus, as he was um, announcing Jesus' coming, crowds were rushing to hear him. And at one point, and this was, this was after Jesus had raised the, the, the son of a widow from the dead, and healed the servant of a centurion. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about what Jesus was doing, and what he heard didn't mesh with what he expected the Messiah to do. And so he sent his disciples to Jesus because the Messiah, this imperial Messiah, the someone who come on, throw off the, the oppression of the Romans, he should not be spending time helping widows who had no standing in their society, and he should not be helping the enemy by healing the servants of Roman centurions. And so he sent his disciples to Jesus and said, are you the one we're waiting for, or should we look for somebody else? I love Jesus' response. He turns around, he heals more sick people, casts out more demons, raises more people from the dead. And then he tells John's disciples, go back and tell your master what you saw. And blessed is the man who does not stumble on my account. Jesus rebukes John the Baptist. This is who I am. And this is what I'm doing. Either get on board or get out of the way. Later, when Jesus is out and he's fed 5,000 men, probably 10 to 15,000, even more men, women, and children. And the, the, the people are so excited to see this provision from Jesus that they come to him to make him king by force. Again, that's not the goal. Jesus was adamant. He was not here to establish a kingdom on earth, a worldly empire. And so he just walked away. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus is with his disciples. He's shown them his power. He's shown them his authority. He's healed. He's done all these things in front of him. And he's asking his disciples, who do the people think I am? They say, well, some think you're John the Baptist. Some think you're one of the Old Testament prophets. Others think you're Elijah. Jesus says, well, who do you think I am? Now, Peter, who is actually very quick to answer, he says, you're the Messiah. 
Now, what's interesting is Jesus doesn't respond with congratulations. He doesn't say, you got it. This is great. Well, let's move on. No, he hears Peter's response and then immediately tells him to be quiet and not to say anything. He then goes on and he begins to teach them that the Son of Man, the Messiah, must be persecuted and even put to death through crucifixion on a cross. This was so contrary to what Peter thought and expected of his Messiah that he took his own teacher aside and began to rebuke him. And when Jesus saw this, what was happening, he saw the other disciples observing this, he turned around and rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are not on the side of God, but of men. And then Jesus went on to teach that not only will he be persecuted, but his disciples will be persecuted. In, in Luke 21, it says, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison and you'll be brought before kings and governors all on account of my name. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends. They will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. Now, the disciples did not like this idea. Jesus was, in a sense, changing the barometer. They liked the barometer of prosperity. They liked the thought of if they obeyed God, they would be blessed. They were not on board with this idea of if they followed Christ, they would be persecuted. Even in the Sermon on the Mount, we see Jesus changing this barometer when he says, blessed are you, not when you prosper, but when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice, he said, and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, Jesus is changing the barometer. He's changing their expectations. They will now know they are doing well in their discipleship, not when they prosper, not when they have wealth and abundance and strong borders, but when they are persecuted, when they are ridiculed, even when they are put to death, that's how they will know they are doing well in their discipleship of Jesus. And again, the disciples don't like that. And beginning with that chapter in, in, in Mark 8 and going on, the disciples reject this idea of this new barometer. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus, his disciples come to him. And they're pretty proud of themselves because they found a guy who was healing in Jesus' name. And the guy wasn't one of the apostles. He wasn't one of their group. And so they told him to stop. And Jesus rebukes them. He says, don't tell him to stop. Surely anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name will not lose their reward. But then he goes on. He says, if you cause one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better, said Jesus, if you tied a millstone around your neck and jumped into the ocean. And then he goes on to tell them that he says, if your hand causes you to sin and believe you're better than someone else because you're with me, cut it off. It's better to go into life maimed than with two hands to be thrown into hell. He says, if your eye causes you to believe you're better than someone else, gouge it out. It's better to go into life blind than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. These are some of the most severe direct warnings and threats that Jesus makes in his entire ministry. And it's not to sinners and tax collectors. It's not to prostitutes and people who, who are not following the commands. It's not even to the teachers of the law who are leading people astray. And it's not even to Roman centurions and their oppressors. No, Jesus' most strong rebukes, his most direct threats are given to his disciples. When they began to think that because they're with Jesus, they're somehow better than other people. At the end of his ministry, Jesus is with his disciples, and he knows he's going to be persecuted. He knows he's going to be arrested. He knows he's going to be crucified, and he's modeling for his disciples what they need to do. If they're going to endure this type of persecution, they have to rely on God in prayer. And he models that for them, but the disciples do not pay attention. So when their arresters come, Peter, who has been sleeping instead of praying, draws out his sword and begins to try and fight, begins to use power to try and protect themselves. 
Jesus rebukes Peter, has him put the sword away, and actually picks up the guy's ear and heals the ear that, that Peter cut off. And then he willingly goes with the people who came to arrest him. And everyone else flees. They all leave him. They did not like this barometer that Jesus was giving them. They did not like the idea that they were not going to prosper, but rather be persecuted if they followed Christ. And they were fighting against that with everything that they had. Jesus was being adamant. He was trying to convince his disciples that his kingdom was not of this world. When he was before Pilate, Pilate was, didn't want to crucify Jesus. He was looking for an excuse to set him free. He was asking Jesus some questions, and he said, why don't you answer me? Don't you know, said Pilate, that I have the authority to either kill you or set you free? Jesus kind of scoffs and says, you don't have any authority here. The only authority you have is what my Father in heaven gave to you. He said, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were my servants, the angels, not my disciples who I call friends, they would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. He said, my kingdom is not here. My kingdom is from another place. Jesus was adamant. He did not come to earth to establish a worldly kingdom. He came to this earth to model something different, to be crucified, to be persecuted. The disciples fought against that through his entire ministry, and it really wasn't until Pentecost that they finally got it. They finally understood that they were to accept this new barometer. And after they accepted that, after Pentecost, almost all the disciples went on to die a martyr's death. In the first through third centuries, we had this early church. And when you joined this church, you knew that you were going to be persecuted. You knew that you were going to be even crucified because of your membership in this church. And the way you joined the church was through your baptism and your discipleship, through your community. This church continued in this way, this ragtag group, all the way up through the third century. In the fourth century, we have the insertion of this heresy known as Christendom. Now, if you're like me, all my life, I've blamed the heresy of Christendom on Constantine, right? He's the one who Christianized Rome. He's the one who, who um, made this Christian empire. And I've always blamed the heresy of Christendom on Constantine. But as we were researching this, I began to realize Constantine was not acting on his own. He was being fed this heresy, actually, through his mentor, through Eusebius. <clears throat> See, Eusebius was the bishop of Caesarea. And he was, around the, the 4th century, he was writing something that had not been recorded up to that time. He was writing an ecclesiastical history. This is a volume of 11 books, going all the way from even just before the birth of Christ, all the way up to church history to that modern point, up to the point where he was alive. He was trying to record an ecclesiastical history. In the first several books, he is establishing the divinity of Christ. In all books one through eight, he's, he's holding up the, the martyrs, the people who are losing their life for the sake of the gospel as pious people, as examples to be followed. Now, between books eight and nine, there's inserted a book. It's called the Book of the Martyrs. And the Book of the Martyrs records one of the most bloody persecutions in the history of the church. And it's, it's the great persecution of, of 303 AD. And in this persecution, while he records it, Eusebius records that this persecution took place in Palestine and Caesarea, that he knew many of the people who were being martyred personally, and he saw some of their deaths himself. So the persecution touched Eusebius. It threatened him. And it's around that time, the end of book eight and going into book nine, that Eusebius's attitude towards martyrdom begins to change. Instead of holding up the martyrs as these pious people, he begins to focus on the emperors. In book eight, he introduces Constinius, who is the father of Constantine, and he calls him a, a good ruler. 
And then he introduces Constantine as, as a, a man ordained by God to rule this empire, which this is all kind of confounding because up to this point, the Roman Empire was persecuting the church. And now suddenly we have these good and righteous and even God ordained emperors of Rome. See, what was happening with Eusebius is when the persecution touched him, he realized, just like the disciples realized, they didn't like this barometer of persecution. And he wanted to go back to the barometer of prosperity. And he figured the best way to do that was to begin propping up the Roman emperors as God-ordained rulers. And so he began putting that bug into Constantine's ear. And this is where this heresy of Christian empire, of Christendom, is actually born. Now, if you're writing a book called Ecclesiastical History, the history of the church, right? Your book doesn't have a conclusion, right? Because the history of the church will, will, will end when? When the bridegroom returns, when Christ returns. So the fact that you're writing the book is evidence that you're not to the end yet. And so your book, therefore, cannot have a conclusion. You're merely might writing a chapter, maybe even just an intro into this long saga of the history of the church. But if we read all 11 volumes, all 11 books in ecclesiastical history written by Eusebius, and we get to the last chapter of the last book, which is titled The Victory of Constantine and the Blessings of Him Accrued to the Whole Roman World, we realize that Eusebius actually has a conclusion. He writes, at the same time, they celebrated and extolled, first of all, God, the universal king, because thus they were taught. Then they also celebrated the praises of the pious emperor, and with him all his divinely favored children. The supreme God granted from heaven above the fruits of his piety, the trophies of victory over the wicked, and that nefarious tyrant with all his counselors and adherents, he crafts prostrate at the feet, not of Christ, but of Constantine. See, Eusebius has a challenge, which is he is trying to reintroduce this barometer of prosperity, and his biggest obstacle to that barometer is Christ himself. And so in order to introduce this heresy known as Christendom, Christian empire, he has to get rid of one of the biggest challenges, which is Christ himself. And so his book, Ecclesiastical History, absolutely has a conclusion. The conclusion is the salvation that comes to Rome, <clears throat> not through Christ, but through Constantine. See, if you want to create Christian empire, if you want to set up a barometer of prosperity, the first thing you have to do is write Christ out of ecclesiastical history. And that's exactly what Eusebius does. His second book, his next book, The Life of the Blessed Emperor Constantine, is just flat out heresy. Chapter 4 is titled, How God Honored Constantine. Chapter 6 is, He was a servant of God and the conqueror of nations. Chapter 8 was titled, He conquered nearly the whole world. What did Satan promise to Jesus if he would obey him? The whole world. Chapter 14, or third, chapter 18 is titled, How while he was praying, God sent him a vision of a cross at, of light in the heavens at midday with an inscription admonishing him to conquer by that. Again, this is going back to the, the, the vision that Constantine purported to tell or to see at Melvin Bridge. Now, if we think back through church history, there's actually another church father who had a vision of Christ. That was Saul, right? When he was on his way to persecute the Jews or the Christians. And Christ appeared to him on the road and blinded him and sent him stumbling into the next city. And as Paul was sitting there, waiting, God sent Ananias to him, and the message God gave to Ananias was what? Go and tell Paul how much he must suffer on account of my name. Why would he say that? Is he punishing Paul? No. What's the barometer? Persecution. Christ was inviting Paul into discipleship, and the barometer of that discipleship was persecution. The next chapter, chapter 29, is how the Christ of God appeared to him in his sleep and commanded him to use in his words a standard made in the form of a cross. Again, go back to the, to the vision that God gave to Paul. 
I, I'm Eusebius may have seen the vision, or not Eusebius, Constantine may have seen the vision, but I promise you, I promise you that vision was not of Christ. Christ would not appear to the most powerful emperor in the world and tell him to go out and conquer in the name of the cross. No, he would say the exact same thing he said to Saul. You used to persecute me, now you will be persecuted. Because that's the barometer. You see, we are, Constantine may have seen a vision. I promise you, I guarantee you, that vision was not of Christ. So now that we have this heresy of Christian empire, Constantine converts to Christianity, creates Christian empire, moves the capital, establishes a national religion. Now, instead of joining the church through your baptism, your confession, your discipleship, and your community, now you're a member of this church because of your citizenship in the empire. So this is up now to the theologians of what will they do with this heresy? Will they collude with it or will they prophesy to it? Augustine is one of the first major theologians in the fifth century to deal with this, who, to be confronted with this heresy. And Augustine is known best for developing the just war theory. The just war theory serves really two purposes. The first is to help nations to fight wars more justly. And second, it's to help justify how Christian citizens of these nations can go off and kill in the name of God and country, because the plain text readings of Jesus' teachings doesn't allow you to do that. So you must do some theological gymnastics to get there. I use the fact that we have a just war theory as proof that Constantine is, or Augustine is colluding with this heresy instead of prophesying to it. But I want to know where he crossed the line. Where does he go over? Because when you cross the line with Christ, he tends to call you out, right? So I read through his readings on just war. I read through his readings on the two kingdoms. I couldn't find where he crossed the line. But in looking through his book on the correction of the Donatists in chapter five, the Donatists are a, her a heretical group. They're kind of a, a, a thorn in Augustine's side, most of his ministry. And in chapter five, he's asking the question, what is the role of a Christian king in a Christian empire? We've never had this before, right? We've always had oppressed church in a, in, in a, in a worldly, a secular empire. Now we have a Christian king in a Christian empire, and he's wondering what the role is. It's not a bad question, but it has a horrible premise because he accepts the notion that there's such a theological truth as a Christian empire, which again, according to Christ, doesn't exist. So he concludes that they serve the Lord by preventing and chastising with religious severity all those acts which are done in opposition to the commands of the Lord. That this, he serves God by enforcing with suitable rigor such laws as ordain what is righteous and punishes what is the reverse. In chapter 6, he says it's better that men should be led to worship God by teaching than be driven to it by fear of punishment or pain. But we found advantage in first being compelled by fear or pain so that afterwards they might be influenced by teaching. So Augustine is writing that the role of the Christian king in the Christian empire is to use fear, punishment, and pain to compel people to worship God and keep the command of the church. Clearly, this is over the lines. Clearly, this is not what Jesus taught. If Jesus didn't hesitate for a moment to call out St. Peter and call him Satan and point out you're not on the side of God but are men, I'm positive he would not hesitate for a moment to do the same to St. Augustine. What are you thinking? You're not on the side of God but of men. This is not the truth. This theological thinking leads to the Crusades, which is about expanding the empire and protecting Jerusalem. In the 13th century, we have another theologian, Thomas Aquinas. He's also dealing with heretics. And he argues that if the secular world has the authority to kill people who break God's laws, how much more authority does the church have to kill people who break, who break, if the secular authority has the authority to kill people who break man's laws, how much more authority does the church have to kill people who break God's laws? For it's a much graver matter to corrupt the faith which quickens the soul than to forge money which supports temporal life. 
Um, therefore, if forgers of money, if forgers of money and other evildoers are forthwith condemned to death by the secular authority, how much more reason is there for heretics, as soon as they are committed, convicted of heresy, to not only be excommunicated, but even put to death? So Aquinas is saying that now the role of the Christian king and the Christian empire is to kill people who don't keep the commands of Christ or follow the rules of the church. Also in the 13th century, we have the introdu introduction of this word, the infidel, which is a subhuman category. And the infidel is first applied to the Muslims or to the Moors, later supplied to indigenous people or people who don't worship the God of the white European male. Now that we have this subcategory of infidel, now we have, we don't even need the just war theory. Now we can base our wars on our theological grounds. We're fighting the other, we're fighting the enemies of Christ. So it's out of this in 1452 that Pope Nicholas V writes out these words and says, invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their persons to perpetual slavery reduce them and convert them to his and to their use and profit. This papal bull, along with others written between 1452 and 1493, are collectively known as what we call the Doctrine of Discovery. The Doctrine of Discovery is essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are subhuman and their land is yours to take. This is literally the doctrine that let European nations go into Africa, colonize the continent, and enslave the people because they did not believe them to be human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was lost at sea, land in this new world which was already inhabited by millions and claimed to have discovered it. The first chapter, the first paragraph, sentence in my book, On Selling Truth, says, you cannot discover lands already inhabited. You can steal those lands. You can conquer those lands. You can colonize those lands. You cannot discover them unless you do not believe the people who live there are human. This makes the doctrine of discovery a white Christian male supremacist doctrine. That is the direct fruit of a church that has prostituted itself out to the empire. We're now going to take a short break here for a minute, few minutes. I'll turn it back to Dina, and we're, I think we're going to do some Q&A for a few minutes. Mark, this is heavy, very heavy stuff. And I think even this last slide that you're showing us, the history of how these lands were taken, is, is, is real, it's honest, and it's so needed for the church to understand. And so, yeah, let's, let's go ahead in our chat. You have... Um, access to the chat, please either post your question in that or unmute yourself and let's ask uh, Mark a couple of questions. So feel free to do either and we'll spend just 10 minutes or so doing this part of it because there's the other half of his presentation that is just as critical. All right, it seems like there's, obviously uh, Mark does have his book and at the end we'll share with you a link where you can get his book and uh, um, his book actually, uh, he has a couple of them that are, that are assigned by both authors. And so um, we'll make that available at the end. But for now, let's hear, let's see some questions. Could you reflect on how the church in the West has appealed, let's see here, appealed to the conquest narratives in Hebrew Bible, Old Testament to justify colonialism? Can you reflect on that? Yeah, and we're going to go into some of that in our next section. But one of the things, I actually did a live stream just a few, uh, about a week and a half ago on my, um, on my YouTube channel, where I talked about, um, this was after this uh, white nationalist terrorist attack on our capital that happened on the 6th of January. And um, I, that Sunday, I did a live stream where I, I, talked about one of the passages that I was quite certain nearly every church was going to read that Sunday and possibly even preach on. And that passage is the passage that says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from the wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. 
Now, that promise is actually a promise given at the dedication of the temple, where again, God's reiterating the second, the, 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 the terms of his land covenant with the people of Israel. As Americans, especially the white American church, that is not God's group of chosen people. And Turtle Island is not their promised land. And so when the church comforts itself by says, if we confess our sin, God will heal our land. They are claiming the promises of that land covenant. There's nothing in the scriptures that says if the American church mm. that helped justify the stealing and ethnic cleansing and genocide and oppression of native peoples to take this land that if they confess their sins, God will heal the land because the land was never given by God in the first place. And so this is just one very small way where the church is so implicitly biased with this notion of we are God's chosen people and these are our promised lands that we claim these Old Testament promises as if they were written to us, and they weren't. They were written to the people of Israel in regards to some specific promises and covenants that God made for them at that time. These are not covenants that God's made with the church today. In fact, again, Jesus came and he was adamant. We don't have an earthly kingdom anymore. We don't have an empire here on this earth. Our kingdom is somewhere else. I, one of the ways I explain it is, you know, if let's say, just to think about this, let's say you're a parent, a grandparent, and your child or grandchild steals someone's bike. And the bike gets, gets broken, and it gets flat tire, and it gets rusty, and the, the child comes to you, and they confess their sin. Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, I stole this bike. And they show you the bike that's in disrepair and broken and busted and everything else. Now, how many of you let that child keep the bike? Right? They stole it. And then they broke it. <laughs> mm -hmm. You may fix it, but do you give it back to the child? Or do you take it and do what's just with that bike, which is give it to the person it was stolen from? This is, this is the challenge. And this is where, because the church really co-ops this theological understanding of land covenant that we actually don't know how to relate to God very well as Christians in a nation that calls itself a Christian empire, a Christian nation. A, there's no such thing as a Christian nation. Theologically, that does not exist. And B, it, we even if, yeah, it doesn't exist. So we have to understand we need a whole different set of rules or parameters of how we interact with God as citizens of a nation that is not only not Christian, it's actually incredibly genocidal and ethnic cleansing. In fact, because of the belief that it thinks it's Christian. Yeah, Mark, that is so difficult to hear, but it's true. Thinking I have a visual of yesterday with the... Um, the, the swearing in of a presidency, right? And they swore in upon a Bible. So thinking about how contradicting that is, how, um, how we, we, there's this symbolism, right? Of what we use, but the practice, and in practice, we lack all of what it stands for. Yeah. So very much so. Let's ask, there's one more question or there's a couple of questions, but let's process the next one. Uh, during any of this time, did anyone ev uh, ever try to stand against the Eusebius, Constantine, Augustine, or any other of the church leaders? Was there anyone that stood against them? I don't have those voices at the forefront of my mind here. I mean, obviously there are always people who will dissent. There are always people, you know, the, the God saves a remnant, right? There's always people who will, who will um, cling to what was actually taught. But what I'm looking at and what the research we did for our, our book was what is the trajectory of the church, right? And, and this is the challenge is, yeah, even when we have, even when we have the voices of dissent, 
the narrative, the trajectory of the church has gone this way for over 2000 years now, or for almost 2000 years now. And, and so whether those voices existed or not, they were not heated, at least not at a, at a large scale level. Um, and so I'm, we're really trying to wrestle here with what has been the trajectory of the church. And again, one of the things that I was looking for when I, I remember when I was first trying to understand where we went wrong and the writings of Eusebius were, were huge in, in coming to that, but then also looking closely at Augustine. And again, I'm not saying we have to reject and throw out everything Augustine's written, right? I mean, Peter was called Satan by Jesus and still went on to be a cornerstone of the church. But Jesus had to correct that teaching. He had to correct that misunderstanding. No, this is not what it's about, Peter. And the problem is, is I don't think Augustine got that correction. Yes, he made this, he, he used the notion, the theological understanding of a Christian empire as a premise, which that, that doesn't exist. And so we have to, we, we can't be afraid to go back and call that out and say, yeah, this understanding is not correct and is actually incredibly damaging. You know, because if you look at, if you look at, you know, when Augustine was writing that, maybe it's just, a, it's a small divergence. But when you go 2,000 years down the path of Christian empire and what we have today, and of the, 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 the call of Christ and of what we have today in, here in the United States, it's not even recognizable hardly anymore because we've diverged so much. So even this tiny schism, this tiny skew back here, has huge implications. And this is, again, why I think that Jesus was so absolutely direct with his disciples when they began thinking because they were with Christ, they were somehow better than other people. Right? And Jesus doesn't just kind of dismiss that and say, no, that's not true. Come on, think differently, guys. He's like, that thinking will lead you directly to hell. That kind of understanding, that kind of philosophy, that kind of mindset Again, it's better if you gouge out your eye or cut off your hand or tie a millstone around your neck and jump into the ocean than to go on thinking that way. And I think it's because Christ understood what the implications would be of that kind of thinking played out hundreds, even thousands of years later. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, human nature. There are a number of other questions here, but let's proceed to the second part because um, folks, um, Mark has agreed to join us over lunch. And so um, even as we dig into the second part, some of these questions could be um, processed and he could answer them over our lunch period. And, and yeah, they'll, they'll, I'm sure there'll be plenty more as well. So let's, let's proceed. Okay, let me just get my, la my second uh, slide set up here to share again, and then we can go in. So I need to warn you that we have a ton of history that we have to cover. And it's gonna feel like we're running through a, a lot and part of this is gonna feel overwhelming. Um, there's gonna be some sections in this next lecture that are gonna make you feel very unsettled or uncomfortable. There may be a point where you're gonna to wanna to turn off your computer or even throw a book at it or something. I encourage you to stay engaged. Um, we're gonna get through this and we actually, we, we need to come to some common understanding but uh, there is, there is going to be a purpose for all of this, and it's going to be for our, our, the betterment of, our, of ourselves and for our churches, but we have to get through some pretty painful stuff to get there. So I just want to warn people that the next half hour to 45 minutes is going to be fairly intense, um, but uh, we'll definitely have some time for discussion after this. Perfect. Let me go ahead and share my screen here again. And for those of you who are asking, this is being recorded and I'm not the best note taker. So what I'm doing is I'm just taking pictures of some of the, some of the slides that he, uh, that Mark, that you're putting up because they're so critical. So if you're interested in that, by all means, but uh, this is being recorded and will be available for folks in um, our webinar today. So, um, so know that, yeah. So initially, the Protestant church pushed back against the doctrine of discovery. This was a Catholic doctrine. They were going through their own reformation, and they, they had 
other things in mind, and they didn't fully buy into the doctrine of discovery. In 1630, John Winthrop, who was a Protestant pastor, he was on board a ship, and they were in what's now called the Boston Harbor, and they were actually here to plant the Boston colony. And on that ship, he preached a sermon titled A Model of Christian Charity. In this sermon, he referred to the people he was with as a city upon a hill. Now, he's borrowing from the language of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, where he told his disciples to be a lamp on a stand, a city on a hill, shining their good deeds into this dark world. He goes on to exhort them in all, excuse me, he goes on to exhort them in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. They should rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. They should keep the unity of the spirit and the bonds of peace. These are just your basic Christian exhortations, Protestant Christian exhortations. At the end of his sermon, John Winthrop is trying to convince his congregants to listen to his exhortations. And so as most pastors do, he begins to quote scripture. Now, the scripture he decides to quote is from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Again, this is the passage of scripture where the people of Israel are standing at the banks of the Jordan River, ready to cross over and take possession of their promised lands. And God's reiterating the threats and promises of his land covenant. If you obey me, I'll bless you in these ways. If you disobey me, I'll curse you and exile you in these ways. And in this passage, it says, but if our hearts shall turn away so that we will not obey and we worship other gods, we will surely perish out of the good land, whether we pass over this river to possess it. Now, Deuteronomy 30 says river, but in his sermon, John Winthrop changes that phrasing to vast sea. Now, why does he do that? Well, they didn't cross the river, they crossed an ocean. So what's he saying? Based on the teachings of Jesus to be a city on a hill, based on the land covenant with Old Testament Israel, the people of, of Israel, the people he's with are standing on the shores of their promised lands, ready to go and take possession of them. Now, this is challenging because if you read the rest of the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Joshua, you will find that the reason, the way God commands his people to take possession of their promised lands is to kill everybody. Literally says, leave no man, no woman, no child, no animal left alive. Promised lands for one people is literally God-ordained genocide for another. I refer to this sermon as the birth of American exceptionalism. This idea percolates for about 100 years. This is the 1630s. Mid-1700s our nation begins expanding westward. We go past the Appalachian Mountains, we go past the Mississippi River. We began moving further and further west. This is about the time where our nation signed what's called a Declaration of Independence, where they are trying to throw off the oppressive rule of Great Britain, and they want to actually declare their independence in these lands, and they write this declaration. And the first sentence of this declaration says, and I, I'm sorry, I have to, this slide got out of order for some reason. Let me find it really quick. Um, excuse me. Okay, please excuse me for that. I'm sorry, there's no, some no kind worries. of technical difficulty there. All good. So I want to go back just to talk a bit more about the Declaration of Independence. So in 1763, King George draws a line down the Appalachian Mountains, and he says to the colonies that are here that they no longer have but a discovery of the empty Indian lands west of Appalachia. This upsets the colonies because they want access to those lands. So a few years later, they write a letter of protest. In their letter, they, they, um, they refer to, uh, they say the king has, has not allowed them to um, has reduced their ability to expand into these lands. And then he says that he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages. They signed their letter on July 4th, 1776. So literally 30 lines below the statement on men are created equal, the Declaration of Independence refers to natives as merciless Indian savages. Now, a few years after that, they write another document. This, of course, is 
the Constitution of the United States, they began this document with the words, we the people. This sounds inclusive. But if you keep reading this document, just a few lines later, down to Article 1, Section 2, this is the section of the document that refers to who is and who is not covered by this Constitution, who is and who is not a part of this union. If you read Article 1, Section 2, the first thing you'll note is that it never mentions women. Second, you'll notice it specifically excludes natives. And third, it counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. So literally, in 1787, this leaves white men. And technically, it was white landowning men who could vote. See, we don't think about our Constitution in these terms, but the reason it was written, the purpose of the Constitution, was to protect the interests of white landowning men. It was not to establish justice for everybody. The same thing with our Declaration of Independence. It is a systemically white supremacist, racist, and sexist document. And these are the challenges that we face as a nation is we don't know how to deal with what these documents say at their heart. We would love to believe even what Dr. King said. We just celebrated Martin Luther King Day the other day. We would love to believe that these documents are a blank check, right? That they were written to include and give justice and to give freedom and liberty to everybody. But that's not the reason for these documents. That's not what they were written to do. The reason for these documents, if we have a Declaration of Independence that says all men are created equal, and then it refers to natives as savages, the reason they use the inclusive term all men is because they have a very narrow definition of who's actually human. The Constitution starts with we the people. Article 1, Section 2 excludes women, counts natives as three-fifths of a person, or counts natives are as savages and, and excludes natives and counts Africans as three-fifths of a person, again, they're establishing people as white men. And so we have to wrestle with the fact that our foundations are where our problems exist. I often challenge people, I say, if you think our constitution was written to include everybody, get onto a Zoom call, much like the one we have today, and read the document out loud you will be appalled at how quickly and repeatedly this document is incredibly exclusive and is not used at all to establish justice for everybody. So by understanding that, this now makes sense, right? It now makes sense why women earn 60 to 70 cents to the male dollar. The Constitution's working. It makes sense now why our prisons are filled with people of color. Our constitution's working. It makes sense that in 2010, the Supreme Court sides with Citizens United and rules that corporations now have the same rights as individuals for political free speech. This is what opens the door for super PACs and their unlimited support of candidates, right? The constitution is doing exactly what it was designed to do, is protecting the interests of white landowning men. I gave a TEDx talk that I won't have time to go into today, but our Supreme Court, beginning in 1823, all the way up until 2005, establishes the doctrine of discovery as the legal precedent for land titles. Basically saying that because natives are savages, we only have the right of occupancy to land, like a fish occupies water, a bird occupies air, and Europeans who are fully human have the right of discovery to the land, so therefore they have the fee title. In 1823, John Marshall uses that argument as to establish the legal precedent for land titles, and that argument and the doctrine of discovery get referenced by the Supreme Court in 1954, 1985, and most recently in 2005. Again, my TEDx talk titled, We the People, the Three Most Misunderstood Words in U.S. History, shows, demonstrates how that Supreme Court ruling in 2005 is probably one of the most white supremacist Supreme Court opinions written in my lifetime, and it was written and delivered by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Why? Isn't she the voice of dissent on this conservative Supreme Court? Isn't she the, the person arguing for the rights of the marginalized? Yes, she is, and yes, she did. But the problem is, is when your land titles are based on a dehumanizing doctrine of discovery and the legal understanding that natives are savages, 
white supremacy now becomes a bipartisan value. And so this is where we, we face these challenges as a nation of what do we do and, and, and how, do we, how do we deal with this? And so we have this expansion moving westward. At the end of the 1700s, we have the Second Great Awakening. There's this growth in churches and a renewal of denominations. There's now this religious fervor as our nation is moving further and further west. And at the early 1800s, this notion of manifest destiny is coined. This belief that our country has the God-given right to rule these lands from sea to shining sea. And again, if we go back even to the book of Deuteronomy, how are you to claim these promised lands? Deuteronomy 20, it says, however, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them. Promised lands for one people is literally God-ordained genocide for another. So I want to look at the 19th century, this critical period in U.S. history. 19th century is the century our, our nation teaches is our century of expansion. It's during this century we had 30 new states to the Union. I made this graph a few years ago. It charts our nation from 1775 to 2016. Every year in blue is a year I found our nation was in a declared state of war, our armed military conflict against another nation or entity. Every year in red is every year I found we were fighting against native nations. These are just a list of some of the wars we fought during that period. If you look from 1811 to 1886, we had almost 75 straight years of warfare against Native nations. Clearly, this was not a century of expansion. This was a century of ethnic cleansing and genocide. It was during this century we passed the Indian Removal Act. This was the act of Congress that gave the military in practice, the right by force to remove nations from their lands in the east to empty lands further in the west. This resulted in the Trail of Tears for the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Cherokee, as well as for um, the, uh, the removal of the Long Walk and the removal of the Navajo and the Mescal Apache from the territory of New Mexico. All told, about a dozen tribes experienced forced relocation, and tens of thousands of people died as a direct result of this act. In 1862, we had one of the largest mass executions in the history of our nation with the hanging of the Dakota 38, which was ordered by Abraham Lincoln. In 1864, we had the Sand Creek Massacre, 150 Cheyenne and Arapaho men, women, and children slaughtered in a single day by a U.S. Army led by a Methodist pastor. In 1879, we had the start of Indian boarding schools. The purpose of these boarding schools was to kill the Indian to save the man. Churches and the U.S. government used these boarding schools to force assimilation upon Native peoples. Children were taken from their homes. They were raised in these military-style boarding schools. They were punished for pre speaking their language, punished for practicing their culture. The stories of abuse that I've heard personally of survivors from these boarding schools is gut-wrenching. And the last of these schools didn't close until the 1970s and 80s. In 1890, we had one of the more famous massacres in Native history with the massacre at Wounded Knee. We had about 350 Dakota people slaughtered, men, women, and children, in a single day at Wounded Knee. I want to tell a little bit of this story. At that period, the U.S. Army and the Dakota people were negotiating the, the, the release of one of the, or the, the um, arrest of one of the Dakota chiefs, and they met at Wounded Knee. Both sides were heavily armed and neither side trusted each other. It's not really known who fired the first shot, if it was a, a, a U.S. soldier or a native warrior, but someone fired a shot and chaos broke out. The U.S. Army had three of what are called Hotchkiss cannons at Wounded Knee. They're accurate for a few hundred yards, they shoot multiple rounds a minute, they're high-powered, they begin raining bullets down over the hill on this ravine to the, to the Dakota people at Wounded Knee. There's this ravine at Wounded Knee, and many of the Dakota people ran into that ravine seeking shelter from these guns. Now, one of the things we don't talk about with this history 
is that the US Congress awarded 20 Congressional Medals of Honor to the soldiers who participated in this massacre. And three of those medals, the one for William Austin, the one for John Gresham, and the one for Albert McMillan were given directly and specifically for their efforts to remove people out of that ravine so that they could be shot down by these guns. In 1840, this is what our nation looked like. We had reached about around to the Mississippi River. If you go on to um, look it up on, um, in books and online, you, you can look up medals of honor awarded by the US Congress. You can look them up by war and by conflict. And if you look up medals of honor awarded by the US Congress for fight in the Indian war campaigns, you will find that between 1839 and 1898, the US Congress awards 425 medals of honor to US soldiers who participated in the massacre at Wounded Knee. And at the end of that period, this is what the nation looked like, looks like. During this period, the US majority population explodes from 5.3 million to 76.2 million. And the native population crumbles from about 600,000 to 237,000. If you're doing the math, that is about a 61.47% rate of genocide. If you're comparing that math, um, that's a higher rate than Nazi Germany had over the Jews during World War II. So there's no other way to say this. Between 1839 and 1898, the US Army awards 425 Medals of Honor for the genocide of American Indians and the ethnic cleansing of this continent. I also wanna look at the period of 1500 to 1900 and just look at some population trends. In the 1500s, the world population was 480 million. In 1900 is 1 1.6 billion. That's a 3.39% rate of growth. Europe during that period went from 82 million to 300 million for a 3.65 rate of growth. Africa, even with the horrors of the slave trade, went from 63 million to 123 million for a 1.782 rate of growth. The US during that period went from zero non-natives to 76.2 million. And the native population went from a very conservative estimate of 6 million to about 237,000, which is a 0.0395% rate of growth, which is actually a death rate, a genocide rate of 96.05%. That genocide rate is higher than the Rwanda genocide, the Nazi Germany's genocide, even than the 19th century genocide. It's one of the highest rates of genocide in the history of the world. It was so bad that in 18... Um, 51, Peter Burnett, who was the first governor of California, he was um, giving his state of the state address. And in his address, he was, um, he gave this quote, that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. While we cannot anticipate this result, but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power or wisdom of man to avert. He's not saying famines broke out and we can't feed these people. And he's not saying disease has struck and we can't stop its spread. He is literally saying we cannot stop killing these people until they're exterminated. Again, let's go back to this understanding of promised lands. In Joshua 10, it says, so Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, and the western foothills, and the mountain slopes together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Now, I want to talk very briefly about one of the presidents that our nation holds in the highest esteem. He was quoted multiple times at the inauguration by both Democrats and Republicans. 
he is upheld, especially during this very divisive, partisan, and, and racist period of our nation's history today as one of our greatest presidents. But Abraham Lincoln was actually a blatant white supremacist. In fact, if you've been to the Lincoln Memorial, at the Lincoln Memorial, there's, there's a small museum at the base of the memorial. It's right next to the bathroom, which is how most people find it. It's the size of a large classroom. And if you walk into that room, on, on each wall, there are plaques with quotes and sayings of Abraham Lincoln regarding his legacy. And on one wall is, are these sets of plaques with his quotes and thoughts on the Union. And in the middle of this wall is this quote. It says, I would save the Union. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union. It's not to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. There's a quote hanging at the Lincoln Memorial that literally states, according to Abraham Lincoln, black lives don't matter. I don't know what's more offensive, the fact that he said it or the fact that, that um, it's hanging there. Now, many people will begin to justify this quote by Abraham Lincoln. But we have to understand Abraham Lincoln's history and his legacy. Abraham Lincoln was president from 1860 to 1865. One of the greatest achievements of Abraham Lincoln is early in his, in, his camp, in his administration, he signed two bills in 1862. He signed the Pacific Railway Act and he signed the Settlement Act. The Settlement Act allotted um, 160 acres of land to anyone who would go west and, 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 and homestead the land for five years. And the Pacific Railway Act was the act that basically allotted the land and the resources to complete the Transcontinental Railway. The Transcontinental Railway at that point had reached Omaha, Nebraska. And um, there were three primary routes. The first route went from Omaha, Nebraska through Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, and came out near San Francisco, California. There was another route that started in Duluth, Minnesota, went through Minnesota, North Dakota, Montana, and came out near Seattle, Washington. And then there was a Southern route that went through the territory of New Mexico, Arizona, and came out near Los Angeles. Within three years of signing that bill, through the end of his presidency, after the hanging of the Dakota 38, and the forced removal of the Dakota and Winnebago from the states of Minnesota, after the Sand Creek Massacre, and the removal of the Cheyenne and Arapaho from Colorado, and after the Long Walk and the removal of the Navajo and the Mescalero Apache from the territory of New Mexico, Abraham Lincoln had literally ethnically cleansed the states of Minnesota, Colorado, and New Mexico to make way for the Transcontinental Railway, making him one of the most genocidal presidents in our nation's history. I can only imagine how many native lives were saved because he was assassinated in 1865. My people, the Navajo people were literally imprisoned at what could only best be described as a death camp in Bosque Redondo, New Mexico, when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. And it wasn't until after his death that we were allowed to return back to our lands in the Four Corners area. The challenge we face as a nation is that history is written by the victors. And one of our challenges we face is that the United States of America has never really lost a war that matters. Throughout most of our entire history, we've won all of our wars. We've never had to surrender. We've never had to be occupied. We never have been disarmed. We've never had a regime change. And as a result, for the past 250 years, we've written our own history. Now imagine if Nazi Germany won World War II, how would they talk about their history? How would they talk about Hitler? Well, he'd be their greatest leader ever. 
how would they talk about the Holocaust? Well, we have Holocaust deniers today. Imagine if they won the war. What Holocaust? There was no Holocaust. This is exactly what we've done. Just to point this out, in, in this period of World War II, Robert McNamara served as an analyst in um, the Pacific Theater. And he helped plan the bombings that were happening over Japan. And he helped make those bombings more effective. And in his documentary about his life called The Fog of War, he was wrestling with what he had been involved in in his war. And he points out that as he was in Japan planning these bombings with General LeMay, and LeMay said to him and his other, rest of his team that if we lose this war, we would all be persecuted and tried as war criminals. And McNamara acknowledged he was right. He and I would say we were behaving as war criminals. Now, he wasn't prosecuted and tried as a war criminal. He didn't die a death in shame, humiliated. He died a war hero, having received some of the greatest awards our nation gives. Why? Because he wasn't acting as a war criminal? No. Because we won the war. So this is the challenges that we're facing as a country. These are the things that we need to wrestle with if we're gonna find a way to move forward. One of my favorite quotes, one of my favorite quotes was given by um, a Diné elder from the, um, one of the native nations up in, the Diné people up in Canada. And one of the things that he says is he says, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. If you want to build community, he says you have to start by creating a common memory. I love that quote because I think it gets to the heart of our nation's problem with race, which is we do not have a common memory. We have a white majority that remembers a mythological history of discovery and expansion, opportunity and exceptionalism. Meanwhile, we have communities of color that have the lived history of stolen lands and broken treaties, of slavery and Jim Crow laws of internment camps and, and segregation and mass incarceration of Indian boarding schools and Indian massacres of, of families being ripped apart at our borders. And there's no common memory. And there's actually no point in our history where we can go back and point to healthy community existing across racial lines. It doesn't exist. I'm convinced one of the things our nation needs is a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. A conversation I would put on par with the truth and the reconciliation commissions that happened in South Africa, in Rwanda, and in Canada. However, I wouldn't call ours truth and reconciliation because reconciliation implies there was a previous harmony. I would refer to ours as truth and conciliation. Conciliation is merely about the mediation of dispute. If reconciliation perpetuates the myth, conciliation gives us a much more honest starting point. And I think we need this sooner rather than later. It was one of the, actually the primary platforms when I ran for president in 2020, is we need to find a way to deal with this history. We need to find a way to deal with the systemic problems that we're facing as a nation. And the thought I wanna leave you with is what is the role of the church? And what are we supposed to do? And how are we supposed to conduct ourselves? And what is the church supposed to do? And before the church can even get to the point of being a proactive agent of healing or of justice in this, we have to recognize some stuff about our own history. I want to read for you a blog post, an article that I wrote for the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship. I wrote this about um, two and a half years ago when I was doing some work at Calvin. And we were talking at that point about prophecy and proverb. And um, this was during the immigration crisis that was going on in 2018. We have literally families being put in cages, children put in cages, families being ripped apart our borders. And our nation was in this crisis trying to understand what do we do and how do we address this? And the Institute 
as a conference I was speaking at, they asked me kind of on the spur of the moment to, to deliver a message about my prophetic message in the form of a proverb. And so I wrote this, it's on my website, it's called From Prophecy to Proverb, and I want to leave this with you as a reflection, as, a, as a, just a, a space of where we can begin to rethink our space in this, in this context as Christians. Wise is the church that refuses to buy into the trappings of partisan politics. Remember, my brothers and sisters, Jesus did not come to create a Christian empire. He came to make disciples. He came to offer his body as a living sacrifice. He came to plant a church. When the church merely lobbies one political leader and protests the other, when for the sake of argument or political gain, the body of Christ turns a blind eye to one sin and magnifies another, we are not representing the headship of our body, who is Christ. As vile, repulsive, and urgent is the Trump administration's separation of families at our border, it's not the first time. Indian removal, the slave trade, boarding schools, lynchings, Japanese internment camps, mass incarceration, even the deportation numbers of the Obama administration. The list of ways the U.S. government has worked to destroy the family structure of people of color throughout our history is as long as it is depressing. So let's stop pretending that President Trump is the God-ordained savior or the ultimate demise of our union. The same with President Obama. What our nation needs is not for Democrats to be better Democrats, nor do we need Republicans to simply be better Republicans. We don't even need our nation to be more Christian. My brothers and sisters, the United States of America is not, never has been, nor will it ever be Christian. Jesus did not come to create a Christian empire. He came to make disciples. He came to offer his body as a living sacrifice. He came to plant a church. And wise is the church that refuses to buy into the trappings of partisan politics. I agree with Kenneth Kaunda, the former president of Zambia, who said, what a nation needs more than anything else is not a Christian ruler in the palace, but a Christian prophet within earshot. I wanna end with that and turn it back over to Dina. I know we're about out of time here. But if we have some questions, I'm happy to address them now. And if we have more, I, I have time to stay after and answer as many questions as we have time for. I know there's a lot to think about and engage with. Right. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I yeah. encourage you to the, the, the in-depth argument about this is in this <laughs> book on selling truths. That's right. um, and uh, there's ways that you can get it. Uh, I know they have some. I think they're going to raffle off today. Yeah. And uh, we'll share a link where you can buy signed copies from my own website too. But I want to make sure you participate in the raffle that they're doing. So Dina will talk about that. But yeah. thank you for letting me be with you today. It's been an honor to be with all of you. Yes, Mark, can you put that website on the chat so everyone can have access to that where they could purchase this? So we're about ready to end our webinar part of it. And then those who want to stay on, uh, Mark will stay on for a couple more minutes for some questions. And then those of us who are on staff with MCC US, we will start part two here at the top of the hour. But I want to just end with a couple of things. One is, Mark, you are a treasure to the church today. You're a prophetic voice, and we want to be a stage to amplify that voice. We need to hear truth. And I, I'm, you know, in, in so many of us who have journeyed on this, I think we needed to find a way of sharing that with others. And your book is a gift to us as the church as well to be able to share with others. Again, this uh, recording will be available to folks on this webinar today. And I want to end with a prayer from another book and uh, called The Myth of Equality that we also use in our tier trainings for anti-racism work. And this is another brother who's written some really good work on this piece. But here's a prayer that he puts in this. And I think it's so important for us to hear today. Here it is. Oh, Lord, forgive us for seeking comfort and prosperity rather than your kingdom. Forgive us for defending the empire rather than railing against the prophetic voice. Forgive us for centuries of cruelty and heart, heart helpness and oppression. Forgive us for ignoring your image in others. Forgive us for prospering from the blood and the tears of generations of your people. And I want to add today, forgive us for being on land without acknowledging whose land this was and is and continues to be. We want to um, 
be a witness of God's voice um, and lament and forgiveness and community is um, the way forward. And so um, again, thank you, Mark, for your time today. And he's putting the information on this piece. And so I just want to say thank you for all of you who um, are friends and partners in ministry. Those of you who are denominational leaders, thank you for joining in. Those of you who are Canadians, MCC staffers, thank you for leaning in as well, board members and staff. Um, may we continue to learn with humility so that we can be leaders for today. God bless you guys.